to this uh, timetable is wrong. Please uh, ignore it and it will be better uh, tomorrow or maybe this evening. But the bad thing is that uh, Tuesday and Thursday, which should be exchanged, exchanged in the timetable. I apologize. Yeah. So, Skype and Frederick are Tuesday and uh, um, McQuillan and Kostya are Thursday. No other change will happen. Who will introduce? I think we can start. So thank you very much. Thank you to Misha Verbitsky and all of the staff here for arranging this wonderful opportunity to speak. So I'm going to talk about rational points. of rationally connected and rationally simply connected varieties. So this is I'm going to report on a number of results which are cumulatively joint work with a lot of people. Uh, Graeber and Harris. And, and much of this is rather old by now. I just want to explain the basic ideas. And then I will touch on some of the newer results. Johan de Jong, and then de Jong and Chu Hua Ha. But I, again, this is building on the work of a lot of other people. Uh, and I'll try to mention uh, their results as they come up. But there also have been a lot of recent results, or more recent results, perhaps I should say. Some of them applications, some of them extensions. So I want to talk about some of these applications by Debar and Kalar. Uh, uh, Jiu Tian and Hong Song, and if I have time, which I probably won't, I'll talk about some of the work of Chile Chen and Yizhu. So there really have been some beautiful recent results, and uh, I hope to have some time to say something about them. But I want to talk uh, at some length about these earlier results, and in particular, I want it to be understandable. So I hope if there are any questions, you will stop me and ask those questions. I, I really don't want to, uh, if I jump ahead and say something I shouldn't say, please slow me down. But as you might be able to tell from these uh, adjectives, rationally connected, rationally simply connected, this is some analog and algebraic geometry of the notions of path connectedness and simple connectedness for just usual topological spaces. So let me remind you of a result in topology, which is very motivating. I mean, we, it's, there's not a perfect anal analog of this in algebraic geometry, but this is what we aim for. So a topological result, it's a very easy consequence of topological obstruction theory. <clears throat> so let E pi T be uh, a serif vibration of CW complexes, e, perhaps a fiber bundle. E 
if the base has dimension r, if it's a CW complex where every cell has dimension, let's say, less than or equal to r, and the fiber is r minus 1 connected, so the fundamental group, I mean, the fiber is path connected, its fundamental group is trivial, et cetera, up to pi r minus 1 of f. So the first r minus 1 uh, homotopy groups are just trivial. <coughs> so if both of these hypotheses hold, then there exists a continuous section. S from B to E. So saying this as a section means that if I take the composition of S and pi, that's just the identity map on B. So again, this is a small part of topological obstruction theory. There are many other directions in which uh, one can extend this. One particular direction is we might specify a um, sub CW complex. We call it uh, D sitting inside of here, and we might specify a section over D, and we might ask whether or not there exists a continuous section whose restriction to D is the specified section. So we can do more than simply ask whether there exists a continuous section. We can ask whether we can make that continuous section have some specified value on a sub-CW complex. This is also a way of maybe getting around this fiber bundle hypothesis, that's a pretty strong hypothesis that say all the fibers are topologically the same. Maybe some of the fibers degenerate, but if we specify that outside of D it's a fiber bundle and then we specify some section maybe over D or maybe over a tubular neighborhood of D, then we could ask whether we can find a section which matches that given section on the common overlap. So, I mean, this is a way of trying to deal with the generations. But let me not say, any, I mean, so again, topological obstruction theory is a beautiful subject and there are many extensions of this result, but let me just leave it at this for the moment, but maybe come back to that issue of extending uh, a given section in a bit. But the goal, one goal is to try to find an analog of this in algebraic geometry. Now you might say, well, maybe B and E are algebraic varieties, in which case we could just think of them as topological spaces and ask whether there's a continuous section. But we want the section to actually be algebraic. Um, and let me just mention before I go on to the algebraic setting, in the holomorphic category, there are some really beautiful results. Really. Uh, the grauer oka theory, so there are sort of two aspects of this. So in the holomorphic category, I'm going to have, again, these are now going to be complex manifolds, uh, complex manifolds, and this is a holomorphic map, so holomorphic fiber bundle. Let's say a holomorphic fiber bundle, <clears throat> and B is a com complex manifold. Well, first of all, uh, of some dimension, the di complex dimension of B is R. First of all, B may not, I mean, B is as a real manifold 2R dimensional, so it doesn't quite match up. But if B is affine, then it's got the same homotopy type as an R minus, as an R dimensional variety. So that's one observation. There's the Lefschetz hyperplane theorem. So if B is the underlying complex manifold of an affine complex variety, then even though B is 2R dimensional as a real manifold, nonetheless it has the homotopy type of an R dimensional CW complex.
Second, and more importantly, there's Grauert's Oka principle. Which is certainly more general than what I'm about to say. But if this is a fiber bundle and the fiber is um, some semi-simple complex Lie group or something like that, so if f is a semi-simple complex Lie group, and many other uh, choices would work here, complex Lie group, then Grauert's Oka principle says, well, when there's a, I mean, in this setting, that B is affine or more generally Stein, then if there is a continuous section, then there's a holomorphic section in the same homotopy class. Then if there exists a continuous section, and here's a hypothesis that will guarantee the existence of a continuous section. If there exists a continuous section, I mean, the same hypothesis is still in, in force that while B is affine or more generally Stein, then there exists a holomorphic section in the same homotopy class, holomorphic section. Let me just point something out. Uh, typically, these holomorphic sections cannot be algebraic. So even if E and B are both algebraic varieties, this holomorphic section cannot be algebraic. So there are obstructions to existence of algebraic sections, which I'll come to. And there are cases where Grauert's Oka principle guarantees us a holomorphic section when we know there is no algebraic section. And what's going on is that if I think of B as being an open subset of some projective variety, then this holomorphic section will have essential singularities at infinity. So the problem in the holomorphic category, there's this beautiful theory that is very close to the topological theory. I mean, because of this very hard and important result. Um, but in the algebraic category, things are quite different. Let me mention. You know, if f is projective, if we're trying to understand the projective varieties where something like this is true, there's been a lot of recent work by Kampana and uh, Jörg Winkelmann on uh, trying to understand the, the Oka manifolds that are projective. So, I mean, there are many other classes of f than just semi-simple complex Lie group where one has this, this type of result. Um, but now let me come to the algebraic category. Yes. There's not some nice characterization of fibers for which you have this principle. There is some characterization in terms of something called sprays or something. But I, I'm not an expert in that theory. So, so I mean, it's easy. There is a projection from a tangent total space of tangent bundle to your manifold, which maps tangent vector to tangent vector around zero. That's a good criterion. This is what it holds for these uh, examples and for CPM. So there's some sort of holomorphic exponential map, something like that. So, I mean, there, yeah. But we don't know which projective varieties have that property. I mean, it, so again, there's in the projective, I should have written this down. So, which, what are the projective Oka manifolds? So that is very much open, but there are theorems by Kampana and Winkelmann. <clears throat> but now let me come to the algebraic category. So in the algebraic category, <clears throat> let me say it in terms of k points for varieties defined over a field k. So let k be a field. And I mean, let me give you the example that's going to be most important for what comes later is k is the function field of 
some variety. Uh, always for me, little k will be an algebraically closed field. So algebraically closed. It's redundant, but let me write it. Uh, function field of a k variety, b. So k is what we usually write this way. It's the field of all rational functions, or you know, if, b, if k, little k is the complex numbers and b is a projective variety, we could say meromorphic sections <coughs> on, uh, on B. So that field, that's the field that's going to be most important. But that's not the only example. We could consider finite fields. We could consider number fields. Number field. We could consider um, the function field of a curve over a finite field. So a, a field like this one. We consider all sorts of maybe intermediate fields like Laurent series over FQ. We could consider some p adic field, et cetera. So, there, I mean, there are all sorts of interesting examples of fields where this applies. The fields that we understand the best are these function fields of varieties over some algebraically closed field. But sometimes we can take some idea coming from the geometric setting and see whether corresponding results hold for these more general kinds of fields. I mean, again, number fields are usually the hardest. So um, some of this is, you know, we're, we're hoping to understand some algebraic notion which might apply in the number field case. But I haven't stated the problem let, yet. Let, you know, x be the zero set. Let x sitting inside of Pn with homogeneous coordinates x0 through xn. So let some x be the zero scheme of some collection of polynomials, homogeneous polynomials. Some collection f1. Fc xn, where again these are homogeneous polynomials of each of some degree. So if I scale all of the variables by the same scalar, well, maybe by a variable scalar. Uh, I don't know there, if there's any difference between writing t and writing lambda, but here I mean t is a variable name. Then that just comes out with some power. So in this case, we say fi is homogeneous of degree di. For some of the results I'm going to say later on, these DIs are relevant. But what I'm saying right now is so general that uh, the question as posed is going to be so general that it doesn't really matter what I call those degrees. But there are some answers where the degrees are relevant. <clears throat> but let me say the question. So question, or problem really. It's not so much a question as a problem. And an incredibly vague problem, a problem so vague so that, that if I state it this way, you can't really hope to have a general answer. But I'll say it anyway. It's not my formulation. Find properties on the field. And I want geometric properties of x. So what that means is this is sitting inside of Pn over this field. I mean, all of these polynomials are um, elements in uh, the polynomial ring with coefficients in k. So I can think about their solutions with coordinates in k. But of course, I can also think about solutions with coordinates in the algebraic closure of k. So we want to find properties on k and on x k bar. So it's just the same, the zero set of the same collection of polynomials, but now considered inside of Pn over k bar, where k bar is the algebraic closure. So we're looking for geometric properties of x and properties of the field, which guarantee that there is a k point. There exists some um, a0, a n, and k n plus 1, not 0, such that 
all of these polynomials vanish on that point. So I mean, give these, the set of such things is what we call the set of k points. I mean, that's just defined to be the set of such a. Well, it's not quite right. They're in here. So I consider these up to scalar um, <clears throat> as above. And I'm asking for conditions so that this set is not empty. Uh, should be a set phrase. So I want geometric conditions on x and some conditions on k such that this is not empty. This is impossible to answer. I mean, if k was a number field, and you were asking for some computer program that, given the coefficients of the polynomials, would tell you whether or not there's a point, then this is impossible. It was one of Hilbert's problems, you know, due to the work of a lot of people. Finally, Matiasevich proved there is no computer program that does that. So, I mean, stated this way, you know, the problem is kind of impossible. But the idea is that we'll restrict to special kinds of fields, and for the most part, what makes this problem difficult is cases where there are no points. So we'll look at, instead of asking, I mean, here I'm just asking for sufficient conditions so that there are points. I'm not asking for necessary and sufficient conditions. Again, that would, that would be impossible. But if I just want sufficient conditions, I might be able to write down some interesting geometric conditions on x and conditions on my field, which guarantee that these things exist. And let me. But let me, before I do that, I mean, going back to this special field, the function field, let me just make an observation. For k is the function field of some variety b. k variety. then um, every xk, you know, sitting inside of Pn, k, is the generic fiber of some x which sits inside of B cross Pn. And I've got the projection down to B. I can just restrict that to x. So I can take this projection, restrict it to x. And now I've got this scheme x together with a map to b. This will be a projective map. I'd like to say it's flat, but that's not, that's not always true. I can't always arrange that it's flat. But I can arrange something pretty close to that. I can arrange that uh, x is the closure of its generic fiber and this morphism is flat away from co-dimension 2 in B, so something pretty close. So let me just say good. <laughs> but it's just what you get by rigging up something which is, I mean, this morphism will be flat over some dense open subset, and then just take the closure of that. But I mean, it's a good, it's a good morphism. <clears throat> in particular, every irreducible component of x dominates B. Every associated point of x dominates B, whatever that means. But I mean, I, just, I can find a good model. And, the way you do this is fairly easy. All of those polynomials, fi, I can expand them. I mean, they're homogeneous polynomials, so I can just expand them in terms of the exponent vector. I want the total degree to be this d. I guess I'm going to use d instead of di. Uh, and then it's some coefficient. These coefficients are elements in the fraction field. So they're elements in this fraction field. So they're each a fraction. Each one of them is a fraction. It has a denominator. That denominator, the place where it's 0, is some proper closed subset of B. So I can find a single U. And if you want, you can choose it to be affine, open. such that all of the coefficients for all of these fi's are actually regular functions 
on u. And now I just use those regular functions to define exactly the same scheme. So now I can, I mean, now because of that, each of these things is regular on u, and I can just form uh, xu inside of u cross pn to be the zero scheme. of uh, exactly the same collection of polynomials. I mean, before the coefficients, we were thinking of them as elements in this field, but I can think of them as regular functions on B, and thus I can think of F as, you know, well, regular function is maybe too strong, but uh, a global section of invertible sheaf on this thing. And I look at the common zero locus of that collection of uh, generalized functions, and that's um, uh, closed subscheme of this thing, so <coughs> the projection down to u is projective. And now, of course, it's not necessarily everywhere flat, but up to shrinking u, I can assume it's flat, and then I can take the closure, and that gives me this good, good model. So, given any xk, I can think of it as the generic fiber, the generic fiber of a morphism over b. And that's essentially unique, I mean, once I've chosen, with everything embedded in Pn. <coughs> uh, and now the observation, which I haven't, I mean, this is kind of half of the observation. The other half of the observation is that the, re the k points of this generic fiber, xk, are in one-to-one -one correspondence with rational sections of this morphism. Of pi from x to b. So what does a rational section mean? It means that I have some dense open subset. Let me call it v this time instead of u. It's not necessarily that same u was over there. And then I have a morphism on v such that the composition from V to B is equals the inclusion. So up to shrinking uh, the base of my fibration, I have a section. Uh, so that's what I mean by rational section. And the K rational points of XK, these things, they're the same as these things. So I can think of this question, which is a rather algebraic question if phrased this way in this more geometric way. And that's how we usually prove theorems about these things. What kind of theorems? Um, let me leave a little space here, because there's something else I want to come back to. And let me tell you the, a very classical theorem, or th maybe theorems, which are, again, very motivational for everything else that I'm going to talk about. And these are Sin's theorem and the Sin-Lang theorem. I'm just going to say the Sin-Lang theorem. So this was proved. The first version was proved by Sin. And then the generalization was proved independently by Sin and Lang. So in this setting, if the dimension of B equals R, and if the sum of the rth powers of the degrees of these defining polynomials is less than or equal to n, then there exists a rational section. Uh, you know, B contains this V, SV, 2X. So this is an example of one of these of a solution of this problem. I'm looking at specific kinds of fields, namely function fields of R-dimensional uh, varieties over my algebraically closed field. So this could be the complex numbers. You know, I want to say k because there are some arguments that involve positive characteristics. So k could be a positive characteristic algebraically closed field. But the case that's closest to geometric intuition is when little k is c, and this is some complex projective variety 
And what this is saying is that so long as the complex dimension of that projective variety is at most r. I write r here, but of course, you know, when I replace this by r minus 1, it's, the inequality just becomes more true. So I could write less than or equal to r, make it look more like that topological result. So this looks very similar to the topological result. I've got some hypothesis on the base, that the base is r-dimensional, just like in the topological result. And then I've got a hypothesis on, well, it really is a hypothesis on the, this. I mean, this is the zero set of this collection of polynomials. The degrees of those polynomials, it doesn't change if I think of it as a polynomial over k, over k bar. So I really can think of that hypothesis as a hypothesis on this geometric generic fiber, where I'm in a geometric setting and can talk about geometry because I'm over an algebraically closed field. Um, and if this hypothesis on the geometric generic fiber, on that sort of general fiber, is true, and this hypothesis on the base is true, then there exists a rational section. So this looks very much like um, the topological result. And so that begs a question. Question. No. So, I mean, so there are a number of kind of mysterious, let me come back to that. I mean, it's the same thing, but you're, you're asking for a hypothesis about the existence of a certain embedding on X. So that's also true. So I mean, the thing is that there's a, this hypothesis is not, so it's not obviously intrinsic. intrinsic. I mean, it seems to depend on the embedding in projective space. That's right. And also, this thing didn't, this XK didn't have to be smooth. I mean, I didn't say XK was smooth here either. But almost every result I'm going to say, except for this one, we will assume that this thing is smooth. So. This is there are a number of unusual things about this result, which I will mention each of these things. But let me first ask this question. Is there an algebra geometric analog of path connectedness Simple connectedness, et cetera. I could just keep asking for higher and higher analogs of these, you know, R minus one connectedness. That was the one that came up in the topological result that the first R minus one uh, homotopy groups are trivial. That's what it means to be R minus one connected. So are there algebra geometric analogs of these notions? And an algebra geometric analog of that topological theorem of the topological theorem such that when this hypothesis is true then my variety is r minus 1 connected and somehow that explains sin length so that recovers sin lane. OK, there are a number of things to say. The two questions that were just asked, some other things. But before any of those, you might say, well, why do we care about this? So I mean, if you've ever seen the proof of the sin lane theorem, it's a very important theorem. It has a number of consequences in algebra, in particular, the algebra of central simple algebras and uh, semi-simple groups and things like that over these kinds of function fields. Uh, why do we need to understand it in this way? So I think that's you know, maybe the main question. Why are we doing any of this? And I hope to explain some answers to that question. You'll have to bear with me for a little while before I come back to that. But I think that is the main question. Why, do we, why should we care about this question? But uh, let me come back to. The questions, so there are a number of obstructions. Let me mention that. So obstructions, this is a positive result. It's saying there does exist a rational section. But in general, there are necessary conditions. So let me say something about that. So obstructions, first of all, there must everywhere exist local points. What do I mean by local points? So if you take any prime divisor inside of B. Now let me assume that B is at least normal. 
I'm working in this setting where I'm only interested in things up to some kind of birational equivalence. I'm only looking for rational sections. I'm allowed to modify B. And if you allow me to modify B, then I can at least normalize it. I don't know if I can make it smooth, but I can at least make it normal. <coughs> uh, of course, in characteristic zero, we can make it smooth. We here not approved resolution of singularities in characteristic zero. But let me assume this is normal and projective. I can, I can get that much in any, over any algebraically closed field. <coughs> Then what do I mean by local points? For every irreducible uh, prime divisor, well, I guess irreducible means prime divisor uh, D in B. And this is for any, project, for any normal projective model. For any normal projective model. I can um, look at this variety xk. It sits inside of P in k. But sitting inside of k, I have um, the stalk of the structure sheaf of B at the generic point of D. So what I really have is a valuation from this fraction field to the integers that sends a rational function uh, f to the order of pole or 0 along d. So let me just say b d of f. It's equal to the order of pole, uh, maybe the order of 0 or minus the order of pole, depending on whether it has a 0 or pole. Um, along D. So when it's positive, or not negative rather, then that means that F is regular, at least at the generic point of D. And when it's negative, that means that F is polar at the generic point of D. And we measure the order of zero pole. This is a discrete valuation of this field. Corresponding to this discrete valuation, I have the discrete valuation ring. That's the inverse image of the non-negative integers. So I've got that discrete valuation ring. sitting inside of my fraction field. And um, by the value of criterion of properness, I can, I mean, up to this, this is only well defined up to uh, scaling by some scalar. I mean, because of the way projective space is defined as points modulo scaling, the zero set of f, I can change f by a non-zero scalar, and it's the same zero set. So up to changing, up to clearing denominators, you know, I can assume all of these CIs are actually in here. So I mean, this whole business I was talking about here of how do I make a good model, I can make a, I mean, there's some ambiguity. Well, it's not really ambiguity, but there's something that can go wrong in co-dimension two. But in co-dimension one, this would be projective and flat. So I have some good model over this uh, spec of this DVR. I can, and what people do is they even pass to the completion. So I can complete this field with respect to this valuation. So I guess I didn't leave myself enough room, but let me make this a little bit bigger. So I've got my DVR. It sits inside of my original fraction field. But then I can complete that thing with respect to the, the maximal ideal coming from this valuation. Now the fraction field is what people usually call KB. So it's the fraction field of some complete DVR. And if there exists a k point, then there exists a point. I mean, I'm looking for um, some uh, a0 through an where these are all in k. But I only consider it up to common scaling. So up to clearing denominators, I can assume those a0 through an are all in here. In particular, that maps to a k point, to a point here, a rational point here, which maps to a rational point here. So ah, let me. Give myself a little more space here. So if xkk is non-empty, then for every d, xkkd is non-empty. So this is a necessary condition that for every these are called local points. These elements in <coughs> where the ais aren't necessarily in k; they're in this completion of k, this viadic completion of k, and 
in order for there to be k points, there must everywhere locally for every choice of d be uh, kv points. And that's a lot easier to study. I mean, it may not seem like it, but it's a lot easier to study these things. So there's a local obstruction. Only here there isn't. Why isn't there any local obstruction? So I mean, I'll, I'll talk later about the geometric meaning of that local obstruction and what's really going on. What this is saying is that if you look at this good model uh, over that spec of that DVR, then some irreducible component of the central fiber has multiplicity one. That's not obvious why that should be true, but that's what is going on. The fact that there are locally um, <coughs> always points. So if there's a global point, then in particular there are local points. Even when there are local points, there's usually not a global point. So let me take a little bit more space here. And there's a name for, it, for that. So we say that the Hasse principle holds. And Jiu will talk more about the Hasse principle in the next lecture. The Hasse principle holds. This is just a name. It's, it's the name. It's a definition. It's not something that's always true. I think maybe Hasse actually hoped it was always true. But pretty quickly, people realized it's not always true. So we say the Hasse principle holds if uh, whenever there are local points, there is a global point. then xk, k is non-empty. So there are classes of varieties where the Hasse principle is known to hold. There are many other classes of varieties where the Hasse principle does not hold. There are a number of cohomological obstructions to the Hasse principle, one of which is the brouwer mannin obstruction, which I'm not going to talk about. But later on, I'll talk about another one, which is the elementary obstruction of Kolil, Tolin, and Sensuk. They're closely related. And even if you everywhere locally have points, these cohomological obstructions can tell you there aren't rational points. And yet, there is no cohomological obstruction here. There is a rational point. Now, this one I can explain. So the point is that, and this is what other people were mentioning as well, we chose an embedding in projective space. The elementary obstruction for this thing maps to the elementary obstruction for this thing. So I mean, this is projective space. It has k points. So its elementary obstruction, whatever that is, and I haven't defined it, it's 0. So the, the, the elementary obstruction for this, I mean, because of the left shots hyperplane theorem, with a very, very small number of counterexamples, because of the left shots hyperplane theorem, when the elementary obstruction of this is 0, then the elementary obstruction of this is also 0. So this cohomological obstruction, that's sort of explained by the left shots hyperplane theorem. But this comes back to the final point, which somebody brought up. Wait a minute. I never said that xk was actually the complete intersection of all these fi's. xk is the common zero locus of f1 through fc. But maybe the codimension is not c. If the codimension of x in p and is c, then we say that this is a complete intersection. That's the, the name, what the name complete intersection means. But I never stated that as a hypothesis here. And this is the final little bit of magic in the geometric case, which will come up over and over again, which is I can deform. So when I'm working over a function field, I can just take all of these coefficients, their elements in this field, and I can perturb them a little bit. And if I take a generic perturbation, then I will have a complete intersection. And then I can do whatever geometry I'm going to do in that good case, find myself a rational section, and then I can specialize that rational section back. So because of the valuative criterion of properness, I mean, I'm going to talk about this principle more. That's going to be one of the key steps in the proof of uh, the kolar mioka mori conjecture. Um, <clears throat> but because of this valuative criterion of properness, if I want to prove existence of a rational point for this x defined over this b, I can first perturb it, find a rational point, and then specialize back. So, that deformation specialization argument, that's a key idea in algebraic geometry. And when you apply it here, it allows you to reduce to the case of a complete intersection. Then you have the left shots hyperplane theorem, which explains why the elementary obstruction is vanishing. But still, the fact that there are local points, that's kind of surprising. Um, all right, well, <clears throat> I probably said more about this than I should have. The proof of this is very elementary. I mean, I'm not going to explain it now. But it really doesn't take more than about half a page to prove this result. <clears throat> it's a beautiful argument. And again, 
I think one should ask, why should we look for this kind of generalization? And there are a number of applications, and I'll explain them, but some of them. But before I do that, let me tell you what is this algebraic geometry analog of, of path connectedness. So, Sorry, yes. I yeah. have an elementary question. I'm confused yes. about something. The abstraction of points. So the original, I think Hasekit was about points on quadrics over, say, That's right. Q. Yep. And what does this say in that case? I mean, you're not taking B to the respect Q. You're taking, what is, no. the, what is for every irreducible? For every irreducible divisor. So I mean, I, I think Hasse was interested in the case where B was spec of the ring of integers in some fraction field. Okay, okay. And then these irreducible divisors, they're the same as the, sure. the closed okay. points. Okay. Right. So, exactly. right. So I mean, I'm talking about the function field case. But another part of this story that I haven't really said is if you take any of these ideas in the geometric setting and then look for the, an algebraic formulation of them, like this. So given your field, you can look at discrete valuations. Now, if your field is the fraction field of some variety, you know, well, m most of those discrete valuations come from irreducible divisors on some uh, projective model, normal projective model. Um, but if your scheme was, if your field was a number field, then the discrete valuations, those correspond to the primes in the ring of integer of your ring of integers of your number field. <coughs> well, I'm sorry, the, the maximal ideals in the ring of integers of your number field. And then you can ask the same sorts of questions. So in fact, the history is really the opposite. A lot of these notions were first formulated in the case of number fields. And then once they had been f formulated algebraically, people realized you could say the same thing in this geometric setting and uh, uh, ask the questions there. But there, there is a dictionary between function fields over an algebraically closed field, function fields over a finite field, number fields where you translate back and forth via this algebra. Instead of talking about irreducible sub-varieties of co-dimension one, you talk about valuations. And that, then that's something you can talk about for other kinds of fields. <coughs> All right. Uh, so what is the algebra geometric analog of path connectedness? That's, let me just write it down. That's rational connectedness. So this is a notion that has its prehistory in number theory. So this notion of R equivalence that was studied by people like Manin when he introduced the Brouwer-Manin obstruction. But it was really intensively studied, and I think given this name, by Campana and Kolar Miyokomori. So let me tell you the definition. And then I'm going to state a bunch of properties. And most of these properties are due to, I think all of them are due to Campana and Kolar Miyokomori. <coughs> but let me tell you the definition first. So let xk over an algebraically closed field. So now, for what I'm about to say, let's assume that our field is algebraically closed. You can ask, well, what should be the analog over non-algebraically closed fields? That's an interesting question. But there are many different analogs. So let me try to avoid that. So let xk be a k variety. Um, when we say that it is rationally simply connected, and there's a variant of this which is separably rationally simply connected that will be important in positive characteristic. In characteristic 0, they're the same notion. So I'm giving two definitions at once. If there exists, and I might as well assume it's smooth. In some places, you don't assume it's smooth, but you can just immediately reduce the case that it's smooth a smooth k variety m and a morphism, a k morphism u from m cross p1 
to x. So it's a family of maps from p1 to x parameterized by m. So for each t inside of here, the corresponding map is what I would call ut. So um, ah, that's probably a mistake. Let me call it little m. I'm probably going to get in trouble no matter what I call this. But I'll usually refer to this as um t. So I'm thinking of this as a family of maps. If I take some point little m inside of capital M and I look at m cross p1, thought of this as p1, then that map to x is what I would usually call u sub m. So it's a family of maps from p1 to x, but not just any family. I haven't got into the definition yet, such that the induced map u0, 1 from m to x cross x. So that sends m to the pair u m of 0, u m of 1. It's not really important that I use 0 and 1. You could use any two points of p1, but 0 and 1, I have those two points in p1, no matter what my field is. If you say, well, I'm going to call it 2. Well, in characteristic 2, there's a problem. I'm going to call it 3. There's a problem in characteristic 3. So you could say infinity. That's a good choice. 0 is never infinity. 1 isn't infinity. But 0 and 1 look a little bit more like the unit interval. So I'll come back to that in a second. <coughs> Such that this map, I haven't finished, is dominant, respectively dominant, and generically smooth. So it's a fact of life that in positive characteristic, there are dominant maps that are not generically smooth, like Frobenius. Just take every coordinate and raise it to the peak power. That's a map from affine space to affine space. It's surjective, but it's not generically smooth. If you compute the derivative of that map at any point, it's 0. So it's not generically smooth. If I can arrange that this map is generically smooth, then I call my variety separably rationally connected. And otherwise, I just call it rationally connected. So they're both relevant notions. And it, it's supposed to be the analog and algebraic geometry of being path connected. And in topology, we would say a, a topological space is path connected if there's a family of maps from the unit closed unit interval into my topological space such that any two points are uh, the images of 0 and 1 for some such map. Any two points of x can be connected by a path. Uh, that's the notion of path connectedness. And this is an analog where we replace the closed unit interval by p1. I'm not quite asking that every pair of points should be hit, because I'm only saying this is dominant. Um, if x is project, well, OK, I'll come back to that. <laughs> so you know, there is, let me, let me just say that now. So there's an analog which is strongly rationally connected. We say x is strongly, and I've only ever seen this notion in the separable case, strongly separably rationally connected. I'm just going to use RC for rationally connected. If there exists such u from m cross p1 to x such that this map is not just uh, dominant, but it's surjective and generically smooth. And generically smooth. There's another little weird, little strange thing going on here, which is I never said x is smooth itself. So this notion of, even the notion of being separably rationally connected is a bit strangely behaved when x is singular. So most of the time we're going to assume x is smooth. Um, but let me tell you some properties, and then I'll probably have to stop. Well, let me state the conjecture first. So the conjecture uh, of Kolar Miyokomori. But I mean, there are a lot of important things to say about rational connectedness. And I'll come back to them in just a moment. But before I run out of time, I want to at least state the result that's going to get proved um, for B. I mean, again, k will be algebraically closed for b a smooth 
projective. They actually stated this in the case that k is of characteristic 0. So, I mean, the conjecture was formulated in the characteristic zero case. The result holds in all characteristics. So let me formulate the conjecture not the way they formulated it, but the way it's actually proved. So for B, a smooth projective curve over K for X, a projective normal K scheme. Uh, yeah, so in particular, irreducible, K, let me say K variety, irreducible and reduced. I don't want to think about that reducible case, <clears throat> although I'm about to say something that would imply that. Um, for pi, a morphism from X to B, well, it's automatically projective, but let me say projective and surjective, which is the same as saying projective and flat. So it's not constant. That's all I'm saying. Saying it's surjective, since this is a curve, means I don't map to a single point. But that implies it's flat. <coughs> projective and surjective. If the geometric generic fiber Well, in characteristic, let me stop and before I continue. In characteristic zero, I could always blow this thing up a little bit and assume it's smooth. And then the geometric generic fiber would be smooth as well. And positive characteristic, even if I assume x is smooth, the geometric generic fiber can be singular. So let me at least assume the geometric generic fiber is normal. In characteristic 0, I can arrange much more than that. But in positive characteristic, I, I have to assume that. I mean, really, there are examples. I could show them to you, quasi-elliptic vibrations, where the geometric generic fiber isn't normal. So I better assume that. And the smooth locus of the geometric generic fiber is separably rationally connected. Smooth locus is separably rationally connected. So these are a lot of technical things. You can think about the characteristic zero case where you just blow up. Because of Hironaka, we can blow up so that this is smooth. Then the geometric generic fiber is smooth. And I'm just asking that it be rationally connected. You don't have to think about what separably means. In characteristic zero, separably rationally connected is the same as rationally connected. So these are the hypotheses. And then the conclusion is what we have over here. Then there exists a rational section. Then there exists a rational section. S from B to X. So I've got a few minutes. Let me explain a little bit what is going on in this conjecture. If you accept that this notion of rational connectedness is the analog of path connectedness, then this conjecture is the analog of that topological result when the base is a curve. That topological result that if you have a fiber bundle of CW complexes, if the base is a one-dimensional CW complex, a curve, and if the fibers are path connected, then there exists a continuous section. So this is the analog of that in the algebraic, algebraic geometric category. The base is a curve. And I'm assuming that the fiber, or at least the geometric generic fiber, the sort of general fiber, is rationally connected. So the analog of path connected. And then the conclusion is that there exists a rational section. What does it have to do with Sin Lang? Well, there's a whole list of things I have to say about rational connectedness. But in particular, when the sum of the degrees is less than or equal to n and it's smooth, so I mean, and it's a complete intersection, excuse me, then it is rationally connected. So that will be, uh, a, that will be an, one answer to this. I mean, the answer when r equals 1. So there is an algebraic geometric analog of path connectedness. There is an algebraic geometric analog of this topological theorem when r equals 1. And it does imply sin Lang. And now mostly what I'm going to talk about, I guess I hope to finish this next time, is this is a theorem. So in characteristic 0, this was proved by Graeber, Harris, and myself. And in characteristic p, it was proved by Johan de Jong and myself, characteristic 0. 
characteristic P, this conject the conjecture is true. So, I mean, again, that's mostly what I want to talk about. But let me, with a few remaining minutes, say some important properties and examples of rationally connected varieties, which maybe will help motivate why we think about this. So, I mean, there are many varieties that are rationally connected, not only these uh, low degree complete intersections. So, maybe. The first result I should say is this generalization of Kolar's theorem. Uh, excuse me, what did I say? Well, it is Kolar's theorem, but really it goes back to ideas of Mori, but it was proved independently by Campana and Kolar Mioka Mori. So I think other people will talk about Mori's fabulous proof of Hartshorn's conjecture that the only projective variety on which the tangent bundle is ample is projective space. One of the key ideas there that Moore used, introduced, was that if you have a curve in a variety on which the first churn class is positive, the restriction of the first churn class of that curve has positive degree, then every point on that curve is contained in a P1 contained in that variety. So in particular, if C1 is positive on every curve, then every point of your variety is contained in a P1. It's uniruled. When you follow that idea as far as it can possibly go, you get the following theorem. Well, it's a theorem. These theorem, I should say theorem. Theorem. That if C1 of the tangent bundle is positive, it's an ample divisor class. Or if you're working over the complex numbers, you can say positive in the sense of having a metric of positive curvature. <coughs> uh, then um, <coughs> then uh, x is rationally chain connected. So that's a little bit weaker than being rationally connected in general. That means that every pair of points is connected by a chain of rational curves rather than necessarily a single rational curve. But then the next thing to say is that in characteristic 0, if x is smooth, then rationally chain connected is the same as rationally connected. Then rationally chain connected. And in characteristic 0, rationally connected is automatically separably rationally connected. All this weird stuff about this map not being generically smooth is because of Frobenius, which only makes sense in positive characteristic. So in characteristic 0 in particular, one, ex one corollary is this, of this is if you have a fibration whose geometric generic fiber is Fano, then there exists a section. When the sum of the degrees, r is 1, so it's just d0 to the 1, when the sum of the degrees is less than or equal to n, and this thing is smooth, then it's Fano. So that's an example of a Fano fibration. But there are many other Fano fibrations. So uh, this gives a generalization of the, the Sin-Lang theorem. Um, we don't know. Let, I mean, but as I'm, this is the last thing I want to say. We do not know in positive characteristic whether every Fano manifold is separably rationally connected. This is an open problem. And in particular, we don't know whether every Fano fibration has a rational section. It's kind of crazy that after all of this time, we, we don't know that. <coughs> so open prob oh, two open problems. But there has been quite a lot of uh, progress on this. Oh, the first open problem, one, in characteristic P, if the characteristic is positive, is every, Fano is every Fano manifold separably rationally connected? We don't know that. We don't even know that if you allow to deform the complex structure. Uh, well, you can't say complex structure, but deform the, deform the thing, separably rationally connected. Maybe after a generic deformation.
So we know so much about these things in, over the complex numbers, but we don't know very much in positive characteristic even now after a generic deformation. And there has been a good amount of work on this, first by Ijou, so progress. There was a result by Ijou that said, well, for um, <coughs> Fano hypersurfaces, that's true. That, um, that you might think, well, that must be s s trivial. But no, it's actually quite a lot of work to prove that. True for Fano hypersurfaces. And then I believe there were two separate extensions to Fano complete intersections, one by Chile Chin and Ijou, and one by Jiu Tian. And then, so Fano complete intersections. Well, I mean, maybe Jiu will correct me if I get this wrong, but separately by Chile Chin and Ijou using uh, log geometry and then by Jiu Tian by relating this to semi-stability of the tangent bundle. <coughs> and uh, so that's open problem one. And open problem two is whether this you know, sections theorem holds for Fano vibrations. And we don't know. I mean, so open problem two. Does the section theorem hold for Fano vibrations and positive characteristics? I mean, this theorem hold for Fano vibrations. In positive characteristic. For Fano complete intersections, yes. But of course, we already had Sin Lang. So I mean, this is very reassuring. It says you can explain Sin Lang this way. But what about for other kinds of Fano vibrations? And we don't know. I mean, if you can lift your Fano variety to characteristic zero, then yes. But we don't know. We have no idea what are the Fano varieties in positive characteristic. We don't know if they all lift to characteristic zero. We don't even know if they lift mod p squared. So I mean, there are all sorts of geometric things for Fano manifolds in characteristic zero, like vanishing of a whole bunch of Hodge numbers that we don't know in positive characteristic. Um, <coughs> and this is one of the, the open problems about Fano manifolds in positive characteristic. Well, I've used up my time. Next time, I'm going to prove this theorem. And in order to do that, I'll have to tell you quite a bit more about, about rationally connected varieties.